it's not going to work. So I think the, the idea of these lectures that you get is um, they're to introduce you to different techniques. So I'm guessing you've had a series of these, and this is the last one, uh, on different sorts of techniques. So I'm going to talk to you about something called um, chromatin immunoprecipitation. Uh, this is, I'm guessing not many of you have heard of chromatin immunoprecipitation. So it, it, it's a tool that you can use to measure the binding of proteins to DNA. Okay, so, so before we even get on to that, uh, which is going to be kind of the main thrust of what we're going to talk about, I'm going to talk to you first about DNA binding proteins, specifically transcription factors. Uh, and I should say up front that actually a lot of what I'm going to tell you is actually pretty much everything I'm going to tell you is specific to bacteria. Okay, so don't get confused, uh, you know, with other domains of life. So that's something that people often do, mix up things that happen in bacteria and eukaryotes and archaea, things like that. So everything I'm going to tell you relates to bacteria. So we'll start off by having a quick chat about transcription factors, how they're bound to DNA, uh, what they do when they're bound to DNA, um, and what their function is inside cells. Uh, I'll probably also give you a, a, a brief overview of some older techniques uh, that we used to use to study uh, DNA binding proteins and transcription factors to kind of put um, chromatin immunoprecipitation into some sort of context. Uh, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about um, analysing the data that's generated from chip experiments. So I'll also give a similar lecture uh, to a, a different module, and they follow the lecture up with uh, a three-hour workshop. So obviously you're not going to do the three-hour workshop, but I will give you the, the same information that I give to them. So if you did want to go away and look at some real data generated from these sorts of experiments, that will be available to you, and you can kind of go away and have a look at it in your own time. But that's a kind of optional extra. So I'll just quickly take you through what the data analysis looks like. To start with, okay, so so who knows what transcription factors are and what transcription factors do? Yeah. Well, they, they regulate transcription by binding to the okay. inside. Okay, do you know any bacterial transcription factors specifically? <coughs> So a sigma factor is not a transcription factor. Uh -huh. Sorry? Rots are probably You've been reading uh -huh. too much. Mm -hmm. Cheeky devil. Okay, so <laughs> so sigma factors, just, just to cover that point, sigma factors are a subunit of RNA polymerase. So then they're not what you would consider a, a transcription factor. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so you, you mentioned Rotar. Rotar is a bit of an obscure one. So has anyone heard of any other? Probably the most famous transcription factor of all is a bacterial transcription factor. Yeah, I think I heard you. Yeah, so there's the LAC repressor. Actually, it's LAC I, which is a, okay. Uh, but often repressors have got R at the end, so like RUT R, for example, is the RUT operon repressor. Yeah, so LAC, LAC I is a, re a repressor protein. So what does what does LAC I do? What the LAC repressor do? Anyone help her out? You must have all done the lap opera, I would have thought, at some point. Sorry? Yeah, RSC is another one. But if we just think about what the, the regulators do, how does the lap repressor control the lap opera? We regulate the expression of lap. Okay. You, you've kind of got all the, the right words in there, not necessarily the complete explanation. So, so what transcri transcription factors do and, and what the lap repressor does is they tend to regulate the expression of genes in response to a given signal. Okay, so in the case of the lap opera, it's the availability of, of lactose. So for anyone that can't remember, um, the lac operon consists of three genes. Okay, so there's a huge gene at the start, and then two smaller genes. 
Okay, so the first first one is called lac Z. Then you've got lac Y and lac A. Okay, and these are, are genes that the cell needs to express if it wants to utilize lactose as a carbon source. Okay. And the lac the lac repressor regulates these genes. So you, you talked about the lac repressor binding to DNA and, and doing things to control the expression of the gene. So where, where is the regulatory protein going to bind to the DNA in this context? I'm just going to turn that off a second. Is that visible at the back? Yeah. yeah. So where is the repressor protein going to bind to the DNA in that context? So you mix it up eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So remember, we're talking about prokaryotes, so there's no intron connection. Okay, so it's, it's going to bind close to the promoter, not necessarily downstream, or, you know, but it's going to bind close to the promoter. Okay, so as I'm sure you are, are aware, we tend to draw promoters as, as arrows. What did the promoter do? Promoter recruits RNA polymerase. So if the promoter's free, RNA polymerase can bind, transcribe the genes, and make a transcript, and the genes can be uh, expressed. If the repressor binds, okay, so if the if the lac repressor binds here, okay, then we're going to get repression uh, and the genes aren't going to be expressed. So it's it's like a, an on-off switch. And as the guy at the at the back mentioned that. The lac repressor recognises the, the molecule lactose. If lactose is present, you want to utilise these genes. So lactose binds to the lac repressor. The lac repressor comes off the DNA. The genes can be expressed. There's no lactose around. No point in making the, the gene products. So the lac repressor binds to the DNA and makes sure uh, that the genes aren't expressed. Okay, so that, that's probably the, the most famous um, example of a transcription factor. Okay, and that work goes right the way back to the very early 1960s, late 1950s. So uh, Jack Hopper and Mono, they won the Nobel Prize for this a few years later. Um, the classic example uh, of a gene regulatory switch. So, so does that make sense so far? Okay. So, that, so that's that's pretty simple. So that's that's what transcription factors do. So so how do they do it? How do transcription factors and DNA binding proteins tend to, to bind to DNA in bacteria? Yeah. You got your hand up? Oi. <laughs> That's right. So, not all bacterial transcription factors bind to the, the DNA in this way, but lots of them do. Okay, so uh, it's, it's probably the most common way in which uh, bacterial transcription factors interact with the DNA. And it's this motif called the helix turn helix. Okay. Do you know why it's called the helix turn helix? Way. Yeah, that's the way it looks. Okay, so you have a you have a helix in the protein structure. It looks like this. Then you've got a turn in the protein structure, um, and another helix. Okay, so these these two helices perform different jobs. Okay, so so one of them is involved in maintaining the structure of the protein and the structure of the motif. The other helix is called the recognition helix, and it's that helix that interacts with the DNA. Okay. So if you imagine this wavy line is the DNA, okay, you'd have a, a transcription factor binding to the DNA with a helix turn helix. And if this helix here is the recognition helix, that's the one that's going, going to interact with the DNA. Okay, so in this situation, where does specificity come from? 
Okay, because obviously not all transcription factors bind to the same DNA sequence. They've all got their own preferred DNA sequence motif. So in this scenario, how do you get that specificity for DNA binding? Okay, how, do, how does the protein recognize a specific DNA sequence rather than just any old bit of DNA? Someone have a stab. Residues on the uh, recognition genes would be uh, able to form hydrogen bonds, is it? Yeah, so, so that's, yeah, I mean, not necessarily just hydrogen bonds, but, you know, lots of different sorts of interactions. You can get Van der Waals interactions, for example. But actually, Van der Waals interactions with the bases are quite common. So if you think about this, the structure of the DNA, you've got the, the sugar phosphate backbone of the DNA, which is the same regardless of the sequence but then you've got the bases uh, that give the, day, the DNA its sequence. And it's the bases, recognition of the bases, that allows the protein to recognize specific sequences. So if you imagine you've got amino acid side chains kind of protruding from this helix, okay, they can recognize specific bases. Oh, this pen's not great. They can recognize specific bases in the DNA, uh, and that's where the specificity comes from, okay? So this might be a, a specific sequence. Uh, okay, so this pen is very good. Okay, so let's say it's the sequence TCAT. Okay, so there'll be specific amino acids in the protein that recognise those bases, and that's where the specificity comes from. You do also get non-specific interactions. Okay, that kind of tighten up the binding, so you'll often get non-specific um, electrostatic interactions with the DNA backbone, for example. So they don't contribute towards specificity of binding, but they do kind of tighten up the interaction. Okay, so lots of bacterial transcription factors bind to DNA in this way, or using variations of this motif. They've got a helix to an helix motif that sits on the DNA, in the major groove of the DNA, double helix and contact uh, bases, and it's the interactions between the protein and the bases that give you specificity. So, does anyone know what I mean when I talk about palindromic DNA sequences? Okay. Enlighten us. So if I was to, to tell you that this, this is going to be part of a palindrome, what would the, the sequence down here be? Sorry? So if I was going to tell you that this, was, this, this is part of the palindrome, what's the, the other half of the sequence going to be? So let me. So this can this gets a bit confusing sometimes. So you've got to think the DNA is. You've got the the two strands. Okay. So if you. So on the other strand, it's going to look like this. Okay. And then if it was a palindromic sequence, you'd have the three prime end up here. So it would be. So, so it, can get a, it can get a little bit confusing, but the vast majority of bacterial transcription factors bind to palindromic sequences. So why do you think that's the case? So if you look at, at what I've drawn... <coughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. So most bacterial transcription factors will bind to DNA uh, as some sort of multimer, usually a dimer. So if you imagine you've got another another molecule of the, the DNA binding protein found here. Okay, so here's the other recognition helix making the same interactions with the DNA. Okay, and you've got this kind of mirror image and that's why you've got a palindromic DNA sequence that the protein binds to. Okay, does that make sense so far? Which bit?
Okay. Uh, it depends what you mean by why. So, I mean, so proteins will tend, so forget about the palindrome for a minute. So proteins will tend to bind to DNA as, as dimers because it gives you a kind of, you know, it's like holding on with two hands instead of one type of interaction. Um, and because they're bind as dimers, and each half of the dimer is recognized in the same sequence, that's why you, you get a palindrome. Okay. So it's like you've got so like you've got one hand there and then you've got the other hand there. Okay? Like holding onto the DNA like that. So is each one holding onto the other strand or Yeah, so it's kind of a mirror image. Well they'll so so if this is interacting with bases on the top strand here, the same subunit will interact with the same bases on uh, the bottom strand. Okay. So the way to understand it is to just go into the PDB and look at the structure of one of these things. In fact, I can dig one out for you if you like. Uh, are all transfractor in bacterial system function, function Not all of them, but lots of them. It's the most common. Brilliant. Okay. So this, uh, this is a transcription factor called CRP, okay, which you may have heard of. So actually, CRP is also a regulator of the lac operon. So the, the lac regulation of the lac operon is a bit more complicated than just being the lac presser. Um, but actually, it doesn't matter what the protein is. So if you look, I don't know if you can see. So here's one recognition helix here. Oops. Get rid of that. So here's one recognition helix here. You can see it's sat in the major groove of the DNA. Okay, and there'll be interactions in there with the between the bases and the amino acids. And then if you look at the second recognition helix here, can you see it's kind of behind? Okay, so it's going to be doing the same thing on the opposite strand. So obviously if I flip it round, that one's now at the front and the other one's behind, and that's why you've got a, a palindrome. So you can see the, you know, the complex is symmetrical. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if you, I mean, this file's easy to open if you want to go and have a look at it. So just Google CRP PDB, uh, and you should be able to find this pretty easily. So, so just to back up for a second, so bacterial transcription factors, gene regulatory proteins that bind to promoters, uh, regulate genes in response to a signal, and they often, not always, but often bind to DNA using the helix turn helix motif. Um, and the way that these things send signals is that, so you've got this, DNA binding determinant, so there'd normally be some sort of other domain on the protein, perhaps involved in, in dimerization, okay, and it's interactions between that domain that, that kind of bring the two subunits together, and it's often that interaction that's regulated by some sort of signal, okay, so in the case of the lap repressor, lactose, in the case of CRP, uh, psychic AMP, uh, that sort of thing. Actually, you could see that in the 
the CRP structure so you can see. Is it going to come back on? So you can see just here, this is the dimerization, the two dimerization domains here in blue. And this little molecule you can see in here is a molecule of psychic AMP. Okay, and it, it's that binding to psychic AMP that allows the, the two monomers to dimerize and bind to the DNA. Okay, so that, that's one example uh, of that behavior. Okay, so, so a nice thing about understanding the way that genes are controlled is that that can, you know, that affects everything. Okay, so all genes need to be regulated, you know, from genes involved in central metabolism, genes involved in stress responses, genes involved in making toxins, if you've got a pathogenic bacteria, genes for antibiotic resistance, all these things need to be regulated, okay? Uh, so you can understand a lot about a lot of different cellular processes by studying the, the process of gene regulation. So, you know, going right back to the birth of molecular biology, right back in the 60s, when people started to look at the lap operon, people have been trying to understand how genes um, are regulated. Okay, to understand how genes are regulated, you need to know um, how proteins bind to DNA. So has, has anyone heard of any techniques, or is anyone familiar with any techniques? Use transfection. Not any techniques. <laughs> <laughs> Techniques related to the finding. Yeah. I've heard about talents uh, consist uh, com, uh, consists of uh, uh, plants transfector. Talents. And how could you use that to, to measure binding to DNA? Uh, we design a specific palindromic <laughs> sequence uh, that is talents based based, uh, based sequence. So were you looking at nucleic acid, nucleic acid interactions? No. Protein uh, pair yeah. DNA sequence. Okay. Yeah. I'm not quite following it, but maybe you could explain, you can educate me. Thanks a lot. EMSA. EMSA, yes. What does EMSA stand for? Electrophoretic mobility assay. Yeah, you've done this before, haven't you? Um, okay. So that, that is something that people used to do a lot of, okay, EMSAs, sometimes people call them band shift assays, people sometimes call them revsin assays after the person that invented them, uh, and, and these used to be used a lot, they're still used a lot, we still do them in my lab. Do you, do you fancy having a go explain how it works? No? I'm sure you know. Okay, so... So these EMSA assays, so that's electrophoretic mobility shift assay, EMSA, sometimes called band shift assays. So they, so they work like this, so you have, you've got a gel, Okay, and you've, you've got a, okay, so let's say you, you've identified a, a new DNA binding protein. You don't know what it does, but you've got reason to believe um, that it regulates, I don't know, metabolism of a certain sugar. Okay, so you might have identified a, a promoter of the genes involved in that particular sugar, and you, you could take that DNA fragment and you could load it on your gel, run that DNA fragment on the gel, and you get a band on the gel. Okay, so I'm sure you've all done that at some point. Run a gel, get a band with DNA. Okay, what do you think is going to happen to that DNA band if you add protein to the DNA that binds to it before you run the gel? Think it'll stay at the bottom. Okay, so so we know at the top and the bottom is the gel's running in this direction. Okay, so where do you think it will stay? At the beginning. At the beginning. Okay, 
So it might not necessarily necessarily stay right at the beginning, but it will it will it will have a different mobility. Okay, it will have a, a different mobility. Okay, and this is why we call them band shift assays. Okay, because the position of the band shifts on the gel. Okay, so actually it, they don't always run more slowly. Okay, so sometimes they'll run a lot more quickly than the starting DNA fragments. So this is just a, an interesting aside, but can you think why that might be? Did you notice anything about the DNA in that structure CRP that I showed you? You're thinking along the right lines. With the, I don't know if you noticed, but that, that DNA in the CRP structure wasn't straight. It was bent. Okay, and the reason it's bent is because when the two helix and helix motifs grab onto the DNA, they kind of force it into a geometry that's bent. A CRP introduces quite a quite a minor bend into the DNA, but some proteins will actually really sharply bend the DNA into like a hairpin. So if that happens, actually the, the complex can run a lot more quickly on the gel. That's quite unusual. So normally the band will, will shift upwards. Okay, so that, that, that's a kind of, it's a useful approach, but it's quite a blunt approach. So it just gives you a yes or no answer. Does the, does the protein bind to this DNA fragment, yes or no? Okay, doesn't tell you anything about, are you going to ask a question? No, I know, I was going to It's because no one normally asks questions, right? So as soon as anyone makes hand with them, I'm not going to ask a question. Um, so, so where was I? Yeah, so it tells you, it tells you yes or no, does the, the protein bind to the DNA fragment. So it doesn't give you any information about how many molecules of the protein bind to the DNA. It doesn't give you any information about where on the DNA the protein binds. Um, okay, and that, that's important information. If you want to know how the transcription factor works, you need to know where the, the DNA sequence is that it binds to, uh, for example. So, so is anyone familiar yet? Yes, that's what I was going to say. So how does DNA's footprinting work? <laughs> <laughs> so you have the sort of DNA, so you cut over DNAs, mm. so you, know these, uh, you know these DNAs, and, and then you, um, you do the same thing for the lower strand, but put the protein back into it, and then you put it on a gel, and when there's a blank space, where the DNA has not been cut, is that where the essential sequence would be? Yeah, yes, that's pretty, much, that's pretty much it. So it's kind of... Uh, a, it's kind of like doing the same thing. So you have you, your DNA on its own, your DNA with the protein bound, but before you run those complexes on a gel, you treat them with DNAs. Okay, so has everyone got that thing? Okay, so here's, here's one DNA fragment. Here's another DNA fragment. I should say that when I draw a line like this, I'm talking about double-stranded DNA, in case anyone gets confused. So this is just a, a double-stranded, two double-stranded DNA fragments. So we've got one where our protein is bound, okay, and in the other case, we've got no protein, okay. And what we do in these experiments is we, we end-label the DNA, okay. So this could be some sort of fluorescent tag, we do it with radioactivity, so we introduce a, a radioactive base at the end of the DNA fragment. So the DNA is labelled at just one end. Okay, that's really important that it's just labelled at one end. So you take these two complexes, okay, and you incubate them with DNAs one. Okay, and DNAs one is an enzyme that's going to chop up uh, the DNA. Okay, and the way you do it is you add. Uh, a very small amount of DNAs one. Okay, so this is this is quite difficult to get your head around. You don't want to completely blitz the DNA into little pieces because then the experiment isn't going to work. So you imagine you've got your tube with you know you're in the lab, you've got a tube, it's got this complex in. Obviously you've got billions and billions and billions of molecules of this complex in your tube. You only want each one of those complexes to get cut once. Okay? And if it only gets cut once, if you get the concentrations of everything right, 
what you'll end up with is a whole series of DNA fragments of different lengths, but you're not going to have any cutting within the binding site for the transcription factor. Actually, it's slightly more complicated than that, but I'll keep it simple. Okay, so you're going to have all these fragments of, of different lengths. Okay, so just to point out, if you put in too much DNA as one, it's just going to cut the whole thing up, and the only fragments you're going to have left with a label on are these tiny ones. Okay, so you just run a gen, just get a band corresponding to this. So you add a low concentration of DNA to one, so each, frag, each complex only gets cut once. Obviously, the difference here on this side is that you're going to get the complete the complete set of DNA fragments because you'll also get cutting in this region here you know so you'll have you'll have everything in there okay and as the lady said when you run a gel with these DNA fragments what you get is a pattern of bands on the gel corresponding to all these different size fragments and then when the protein is present Okay, you're going to get a gap. Okay, and that tells you exactly where the protein was bound to the DNA. Does that make sense? Do you want to see what one of these gels looks like? If I can dig one out, or are you not interested? Yeah? So I think this, I just think this is an amazing technique. Okay, because, you know, this goes back to the 60s and 70s that people were doing this. And, you know, it's just mixing stuff together in tubes, you know, mix a protein with some DNA and then some in a tube. And it tells you about where a protein is bound to the DNA at base pair resolution, you know, at the, at the resolution of a single base, which I just think is amazing. So I remember being an undergraduate student doing my final year project. Um, so I was actually in a lab just over there behind you in the tower. And there used to be a, a Russian postdoc in the lab. She was quite, she was a bit older, so I think she'd done a PhD in Russia, then come to the UK and done a PhD, and she was doing a postdoc. And she used to do these DNAs one footprints, and she'd run around with the tubes, you know, in her hands, the, these radioactive tubes, and she'd go, "It's okay, I like my children." You know, and everyone would be running out of the way when she came out the lab, through the lab with the radioactivity. Um, let me. So that, that's not a bad one. Okay, so can you see that there? So this is this lane here is where they've got um, no protein present. You can see they get cutting of the fragment all the way along. Actually, I no, I suspect that is. So I thought that was a ladder, but I don't think it is. So this is. You know, this is when they get complete digestion of the DNA fragment, and then what they'll be doing here is adding more and more of the DNA binding protein. You can see it gradually binds and protects this region from being cut. Okay, and then you can determine the sequence of that region, and you know exactly what your protein's binding to. Okay, and that, you know, that's 1960s, 1970s technology, and it's still one of the most accurate ways to find out exactly where a protein is binding to DNA. So I just think that's brilliant that you can do that stuff just by mixing stuff together in tubes. You can get that kind of base pair resolution information about the way in which a protein binds to DNA. So we used to, I don't know if you've ever seen the sort of gels we used to, so have you all run gels in, at various points? Probably agarose gels? Yes. Yeah, probably this sort of size. Probably, you know, quite thick. I'm guessing. So when you run these sorts of gels, you run a gel that's about that big, okay? And the gel is about as thick as a sheet of paper. Okay, so when you get in those gel, you know, you run it between two glass plates and you've got a very thin layer of gel in the middle. 
So when you're pulling those plates apart, trying to keep that paper thin gel intact is quite tricky. So it's at that point you spent the entire day doing your experiment. It's you know it's five o'clock at night. You want to go home. You're taking the gel plates apart, and if the gel starts to stick to one plate and not the other, you just end up with this mess of gel on the plate. You know it's, it's heartbreaking. My worst ever day in the lab was. Um, oh, it was. I guess it was about 2003, something like that. And I was going to watch the. Actually, it must have been about this time of year because the UK snooker championship was on, and I was going to watch it in the evening. So I'd come into the lab about six in the morning to do one of these experiments. Started in the lab, you know, there was no one around, it was going great guns. Got to about nine o'clock and the fire alarm went off in the department. So I had to go outside, bin the experiment, come back in, start again, start it again. Got to, got to load my fragments on the gel. The gel started running. My wife called from work and she's like, oh, I've got to go to Selly Oak Hospital. This is like before the big hospital was up there and it was over by Bourneville. She's like, I've got to go to hospital, I've got this rash. She works at the school. I've got this rash, they think I might have meningitis. Can you come to the hospital? I was like, oh, I'm bringing the gel off. <laughs> <laughs> I'll come. So I went to the hospital, sat with her for a bit. They, they said she was fine, but not to go back to school that day. I was like, can you wait on the car park outside so Biosciences while I pour another gel? Because my gel was, again, had gone to pop by this point. So she sat outside, loaded another gel, took her home, got back to work and said, well, you know, I'm going to the snooker tonight. I'm not going to have time to come home now. I'm going to go straight to the snooker to get this experiment done. So I rushed. It's now like 7 o'clock at night. Been here for 13 hours. Got, the, got my two plates, pulling them apart. Someone came to the lab and said something to me and distracted me and one slipped out of my hand and smashed all over the floor. And the whole experiment went in the bin. No, so that was, a bit, that was my worst ever day in the lab. So then I went to watch the snooker, and the, the snooker was awful as well. Um, okay, so so that's that's kind of the thing that we used to do with these DNA binding proteins. Okay, so the, the problem is with those approaches. The, the problem is with those approaches that they're very time-consuming. Okay, so. If you want to do a gel shift assay or you want to do a, a DNA to one's footprint, you've got to purify the protein. Purifying proteins can be time consuming. Lots of DNA binding proteins actually can be very difficult to purify. Uh, they tend not to lend themselves very well to purification. So it can be a lot of work um, to do those sorts of experiments. The other problem is that if you're doing that sort of experiment, you can only do one target at a time. You know, so lots of Transcription factors will bind to hundreds of promoters. Okay, so a few will bind to a small number, but most bind to lots. And if you want to know about all of those, you know, you, there's no way you can go around doing hundreds of gel shift assays or hundreds of DNA swan footprints. It's you know, it's just not feasible. So those approaches are okay, but they can't be applied um, on a large scale. So, of course, the, a big difference between now and when those sorts of techniques were first used is that, that now we've got whole genome sequencing. Um, and, you know, new genomes are being sequenced all the time. We're identifying new bacterial uh, species, strains, and isolates all of the time. Lots of these carry transcription factors that we know nothing about that probably play important roles in things like virulence and antibiotic resistance. And so we need to know what they do, we need to know what they do quickly. So we don't have time necessarily to, to do hundreds of DNAs one footprint. So we need techniques that, that can look at DNA binding events, you know, on a large scale across a whole chromosome quickly. Okay, so we can work out what these things do. So that's where uh, chromatin immunoprecipitation comes in. So the, the benefit uh, of something like chromatin immunoprecipitation is that it can be applied on a chromosome-wide scale. Okay, so you can look at all of the potential binding sites for a given transcription factor in just one experiment. Okay, so that, that's a huge advantage. Another advantage is that things like gel shift assays and DNA to one footprints, you're doing everything in the test tube. Okay, so you've isolated the DNA, you've isolated the protein, taken them away from the rest of the components of the cell and you're just looking at the interaction between the two things 
Of course, in the cell, things are way, way more complicated than that. Um, and you can't take those extra complications into account in these in vitro experiments where you're just looking at things in the test tube. So the major advantage of protein immunoprecipitation is that you can do it across a whole chromosome and that you can do, actually do it inside living cells. Okay, so that's what I'm going to, I'm going to talk to you about. So chromatin immunoprecipitation or CHIP, you can kind of tell everything you need to know or most things you need to know about the procedure from the name. Okay, so would anyone like to hazard a guess as to how this sort of approach might work or just what might be involved? Um, basically Okay, you've got, you got most of the right words in there. So, ligase, you, you did say ligase. Uh, yeah, well, I'm trying to remember what I would talk about this morning. Yeah, okay, so ligase not quite, but the rest the rest is, is pretty much right. Okay, so the bit chromatin, so that, so obviously chromatin is what eukaryotic scientists call protein DNA complexes. Okay, and the reason it's called chromatin immunoprecipitation is because the technique was invented for eukaryotic cells. Actually, you can apply it just as well to prokaryotic cells. That's why it's got the term chromatin at the start. So that's just a reference uh, to, to what the material that you do the experiment with, okay, protein DNA complexes. Okay, the immuno part, immuno part refers to the use of an antibody. Uh, so, you, so you mentioned the use of an antibody to isolate the protein DNA interactions. Okay, so that's why it's got the word immuno in there, because we're using an antibody. And then precipitation is obviously pulling something out of the solution, precipitating something. Uh, and immunoprecipitation means that you pull something out of the solution using an antibody. Okay, so that's how the technique works. You use an antibody to isolate uh, these chromatin for want of a better word, complexes, these protein DNA complexes. So, how do you get antibodies for proteins? Yeah? You'd have to raise it in an animal, so you inject um, something, like whatever it is you're trying to get antibodies against, into an animal, a sheep or a rabbit, something like that, and then you Purify the antibodies that they make over a period of time from the blood serum. Yeah. Okay. So that's a, that's a perfect answer. You you get your purified DNA binding protein. You inject a poor mouse or a rabbit or whatever it's going to be. They make antibodies from all sorts of things. If you look like goats, sheep, horses, all sorts of things. So you inject the animal. Okay. Obviously the 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 animal's immune system sees the protein, recognises it as recognizes it as foreign, that elicits an immune response. The animal makes antibodies against the protein that you can then isolate, you can use those in your experiment. So that doesn't quite fit with what I was saying a moment ago. So a moment ago I was saying, well, the, the benefit of this is, you know, you don't have to purify the proteins. You can do things on a, a large scale. You can do it very quickly. It takes months and months to generate antibodies. Okay, so by the time you've purified your protein, injected the animal, isolated the antibodies, you could be getting on for a year down the line since you've decided to do the experiment. Um, and then often antibodies that you might get from the animal might not be very good, they might only bind to the protein quite weakly, they might not work in chromatin immunoprecipitation experiments. So actually, although you can do it that way, and sometimes people do, they tend not to, they tend to do something else. So they only tend to use an antibody specific for the protein if one already exists. So, for example, the lapopressin, known about it for years, loads of people have got antibodies, you can use them, not a problem. But if you've got a brand new transcription factor that you've identified, no one's ever worked on it before, you're the first person, there's something else that you can do to get around that problem. You're still going to use an antibody, you're still going to immunoprecipitate the protein, but there's another way that you can do it to, to avoid this problem. Any ideas? You thinking about something? What do you think? Mm, 
Okay, so you can kind of get in there. You can order antibodies. So if I went on to the, the Sigma website now and flick through, they'd have a load of load of different antibodies that you can buy. And some of those antibodies would be for tags, so things like flag tags, hiss tags, things like that. So do you know what I mean by tags, yeah? Okay, so that, that's a way that you can get around the problem. So there, there are all sorts of commercially available antibodies that you can get off the shelf uh, for things like flag tags, MIC tags, hiss tags, uh, all sorts of SPA tags, lots of different tags. So if you can engineer your bacterial strain to make a, a version of the protein you're interested in with one of these tags on, then, then you home and dry. Okay, you can do the experiment straight away. You can just buy the, the antibody off the shelf. Okay, and that's, that's what we would tend to do. Uh, so common tags. Common tags, Mick, Flag, Hiss, SPA, there are, there are all sorts of different tags. So when we do these sorts of experiments, we tend to use either a flag tag or a MIC tag. Okay, so this, this is a, a great way to get around the problem. Okay, so so you've got your you've got your strain, you've you've introduced your tag, maybe you were lucky and you've already got an antibody that you could use. So, so this is this is how the experiment goes. Okay, so you, you've got your bacteria. So this is my crude diagram of a bacterial cell. So you've got your you've got your cell with all the, the DNA inside. So the DNA is this white ball of string, and then all sorts of different proteins bound to the DNA. Incidentally, does anyone know what this structure is called in a bacterial cell? So bacteria don't have a nucleus, but they do have this structure, which is the nucleoid. Okay, so the nucleoid is, is the name for the folded bacterial chromosome. Okay, so you've, you've got your cells. You would grow them in whatever conditions were appropriate for the experiment. So say if you've got a, you'd isolated some, I don't know, pathogenic E. coli strain from the fried chicken shop in Celio. You make, I don't know, grow you grow your cells on fried chicken juice or something like that. So you've got, the, you've got your cells, grow them in the right conditions, and then you add uh, formaldehyde to your culture of cells. So does anyone know what formaldehyde is going to do to the cells? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so that's what formaldehyde does. So you, yeah. Yeah, so people use formaldehyde for preservation, it's for that reason. Okay, so what formaldehyde does is it cross-links biological molecules to each other. So it'll cross-link proteins to proteins, proteins to DNA. So everything becomes covalently attached, can't function anymore, and it'll preserve it in that state. Um, so that's what, actually one of the reasons why cigarette smoke is so toxic, it's because it contains formaldehyde. So you imagine if you're breathing in formaldehyde into your lungs, that's getting into your lovely, fresh lungs, into the cells, cross-linking proteins to DNA. And obviously, if you cross-link the wrong protein to the wrong bit of DNA, it's curtains and you know, the cell cycle can go awry, and that's when tumours can develop. So that's why formaldehyde is so um, toxic and why cigarette smoke is so toxic. So when we work with formaldehyde in the lab, you know, we have to wear a mask and do it in the fume cupboard, yet you can go across the spa and get 10 B&H and, and you're away. You can, you know, breathe in as much formaldehyde as you want. So you add the formaldehyde and within minutes, okay, various proteins have been cross-linked to the DNA. And this is going to be all of the proteins bound across the chromosome, not just the one that you're interested in. Okay, so at the moment, this is all still within the cell envelope. So you need, to, you need to get at the DNA and the protein uh, complexes. So, so we do several steps, so this kind of combines several steps. So we treat the cells with lysozyme, okay, which is going to break down the cell envelope. It's going to uh, allow you to, to break open the cells. And we also sonicate the samples. And whenever you use a sonicator, which you know what I mean by a sonicator. Yeah, so you, you have like... Uh, 
you have like a metal probe that you put into the culture sample and that kind of vibrates at high frequency and that sends kind of shock waves through the solution uh, and breaks molecules apart. Okay, so that'll, if the cells haven't completely broken open, that'll finish the job. And what it also does is break the DNA into small fragments. Okay, so you've now got these fragments of DNA. They're, they're all going to be of different sizes, but the average size is about 500 base pairs in these sorts of experiments. And they're covalently attached to any protein that were bound at the moment you had the formaldehyde to the cells. Okay, and amongst this mess of protein and DNA is going to be the protein you're interested in cross-linked uh, to the, the various DNA targets that it was bound to. Okay, so this is where the immunoprecipitation bit comes in. So we, we tend to draw antibodies like this. The antibodies are going to recognise the epitope tag if you're doing it that way, or they're going to recognise the protein directly if you put a, a, an antibody against the protein. And they're going to bind to them very tightly. Antibodies bind very, very tightly normally. Uh, to their targets. Okay, you can then fish those complexes out of this solution. So we have, um, we do this using agarose beads. So we have these, these tiny agarose, when I say tiny, you, you, you can just about see them with the naked eye, these agarose beads uh, that are cross-linked to proteins that specifically recognise antibodies. Okay. So these are, these are going to go into the, the mixture that you've got, bind to the antibody, and pull these things out of solution. Okay? Then you can wash away all the other stuff that you don't need, and you're just left with the complex that you're interested in. Does that make sense? Okay? And obviously, these DNA fragments should correspond to the parts of the chromosome uh, where your protein was bound to the DNA. Yeah? So the last step uh, is to get rid uh, of everything but the DNA. So at the end of the procedure, you just want the DNA fragments that represent the binding site for the protein you're interested in. Okay, and we do that by um, heating the sample up and putting it in an acidic buffer. Okay, and that reverses the covalent bonds that have been formed. Okay, so you can get rid of all the stuff you don't need and you just ended up with this sample of DNA, so you've got your tube and it's just got bits of DNA in and those bits of DNA are the parts of the chromosome that your protein is bound to. Okay, so simple. So the so next is the tricky bit. So next you need to figure out what all of these different DNA fragments are. Yes. To reverse the cross things. Okay, so you use heat and acidic buffer to reverse the cross things. Yes. Do you want me to go through that bit again? Or? So you use the antibody to grab onto the complex, pull it down, wash away all the other stuff. You've just got your complexes of interest left. Then you use the heat and the acidity to, to reverse the cross links, and then you've just got your DNA. Okay. So you need to work out what these DNA fragments are. So there are there's several different ways to do this. Any any thoughts? Is that yeah? Sequence them. Yeah, you can sequence them. But what did it's so, okay, so you can sequence them now. You couldn't sequence them ten years ago. Yeah. So so what okay, so that's one way you can sequence it other ways. Yeah, so that's kind of the more old fashioned way to do it. So, so there are kind of, if you read the literature and look for chrome tin immunoprecipitation or chip experiments prior to about 2008, you'll see that most of them were called chip chip experiments, and that's because people use the hybridization microarray approach. So, people used to call DNA microarray DNA chips, hence chip chip. Okay, so you have all your fragments, you label them with a fluorescent dye hybridised them to a, a DNA microarray and each fragment would recognise a, a probe on the microarray and you'd know the identity of the probe and what sequence it corresponds to so you know what the fragment is. Okay, so that's the way we used to do it, chip, chip. The way we would do it now is just to, to make a sequence in the library, just sequence the lot um, 
and then you get your answer. Okay, and obviously that's a lot more accurate because you get the complete sequence of each fragment. When you do the hybridization on a microarray, you limit it by the information on the array. Okay, so the arrays aren't going to cover every single position in the genome. They're going to cover intervals across the genome. Okay, so you lose resolution. You look confused. So they'll all be different sizes, but the average size will be about 500. Is it literally just the bases where the protein has been found? No. It's bigger than that because with the sonication step, you can only get down to a certain size. So beyond that, you could sonicate it forever and it's never going to get any smaller. Okay, so so the want it smaller, Well, okay, so there is a derivative of this technique, which has got its problems, I think, which is called chip exo. Okay, it's called chip exo because you use an exonuclease. So what does an exonuclease do? So it's an exo nucleus because it comes in from the outside, it's exo. So you imagine if you're at your back and you were at this step, if you were to add an exo nucleus now, it's going to nibble back on the DNA from each end, and then you're going to let, get a little bit of the DNA protected where the protein's bound. Okay, so then you get DNA fragments that more or less just represent the binding site. So that's a, a derivative of this approach. But I'll tell you in a minute, actually, even with the larger fragments, you can work out exactly where the proteins bound to the DNA, but I'll get on to that uh, in just a minute. So where was I now? If you sequence it, you know... Yeah. Oh yeah, you just, I mean, as long as it's unique, I mean, 500 is going to be unique. Probably 20 would be easy. <laughs> so the, actually the exception to that is there are certain parts of the chromosome that are very repetitive. For example, ribosomal RNA operons are exactly the same virtually. So we tend to ignore those and um, just kind of throw them out of the analysis. But normally these things would be unique. Okay, so you can sequence it, you can put them on a microarray. The other thing you can do, if you know what you're looking for, okay, so let's say you're doing this with the lap repressor, you know that it's going to bind to the lap promoter. So you could just design PCR oligos to amplify the, the bit of DNA that you're looking for to see if it's in this sample. So that's chip PCR, which is something that people also do. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so we used to do these with a company called OGT, but that doesn't matter. Okay, so you were talking to me um, about how you know where the protein's bound to DNA. So I think what I will do is show you what the data look like. Okay, so this is some real um, data that we generated. So this is from... Um, this is from microarrays, but chipsy data looks very similar. So on this axis, you've got the position on the chromosome. <clears throat> and then this axis is telling you about the abundance of that particular DNA fragment. Okay, and you can kind of go across the whole chromosome. So this is the E. coli chromosome. And it looks like this. And, you know, you get these various peaks. And that's telling you that you've pulled out that section of DNA from the experiment. Okay, you can kind of, you make it a bit bigger. You can see, kind of see the shape of the peaks, if you zoom in a bit. Okay, so you see there, we've pulled out that section of DNA. And the reason you get a, a peak that's that sort of shape, Okay, so see here, this peak has got an obvious maximum point there. So if you were to, if you were to zoom in on the peak, it would kind of look like that. If you zoom right in on it. And the reason it looks like that is, okay, so say if the protein is bent there, when you fragment the DNA, you're not always going to fragment it with the protein in the middle. So you'll get 
you'll get that fragment, you'll get a fragment like that, you'll get a fragment like that. Okay? So when you look at the abundance of the various bits of DNA, this is slightly less abundant because there's only, I've only pulled that little bit down once, whereas this little bit here you've pulled down twice, this bit you've pulled down three times, this bit you've pulled down four times. Do you see? So you end up with a, a peak and the protein should be binding in the middle. Does that make sense? So you're always going to pull out the bit of DNA that the protein's actually bound to. That has to be in every single complex that you pull out. Okay, you don't always have to pull out the bit that's down here because you could have got this fragment. Okay, and that's why the abundance looks like this. Got it? Yeah? Okay, so, th so that's more or less telling us where the protein is bound to the DNA. Okay. So what we would really like to know is actually the sequence that the protein is binding to. So just like we can in the DNA's one footprint and experiment. And actually you can get that information from this sort of data. Okay, so what you would do is go through this entire profile, make a note. Normally, you, you, I mean, you could do this manually for E. coli because it's got quite a small genome. But, you, you know, you can do it in an automated way as well. You go through the data identify all of the peaks, and then we extract the DNA sequences that fall under these peaks, these 500 base pair DNA sequences. Okay, so what should all of those 500 base pair sequences have in common? They should have one thing in common. Yeah. What sequence? Yeah, the sequence that the protein binds to. So all of the rest of the DNA sequence should be just, you know, different. But they should all share this binding site for the protein. Okay, so if you do that for this data, um, these are the sequences that you get. Okay, so these are the sequences, the DNA sequences under each one of those peaks. Okay, and then you can put those sequences into various, you know, there are various things that will analyse them for you. So the one that we use now is called mean. Okay, so you, you just pop in all the DNA sequences that you've pulled out. Um, and then you tell mean to go and look for, for something that reoccurs in that sequence. Okay, so, I mean, you're, not, you, you're never going to do this, probably most of you, but you have to be careful the way that you set the parameters um, and kind of give the program a bit of a hand to find the right sort of thing. So the problem with these sorts of analyses is that they'll always find something in the sequence. Okay, even if you give it a completely random sequence, it will always find something that it thinks is special. Okay, so you kind of have to use what you know about DNA binding proteins to kind of give the program a bit of a helping hand. So we know, for example, that it's likely to be a palindrome. Um, we know that the maximum width, because it's the case for most bacterial transcription factors, we know that the width is going to be between about 10 and 20 bases. Okay, but once we've given it that information, it should be able to find the motif. Okay, so I don't know how long this will take. Mean works really quickly in the morning, and then by the time you get to the afternoon and all the Americans start to wake up, they start to use it and it, you know, really slows down the surface. So I'll just leave that running and hopefully it'll spit out an answer soon. Okay, so what Mean's doing now in the background is looking at each one of those sequences and it's aligning them in all possible combinations and it's trying to find some sort of motif in those sequences that occurs more than you would expect by chance. Okay, um, I'll let that run in the background. So these are actually experiments that we did uh, with the Japanese visitor to the lab in about 2007. A, a guy called Tomohiro Shimada, uh, and he came from a lab in Tokyo. And it, so Japanese research labs are not like UK research labs, so so you've got the professor that's in charge, and it's you know it's seen as very 
disrespectful to him if he's in work and you're not. So you have to get to the lab before him and you can't leave until he's gone home. Okay, so these guys work like crazy. And uh, so when Tom Hero got here, he was like, oh, I'm just going to take it easy. So he'd, he'd come in for like a week, he'd do an experiment, and then he'd bugger off to Amsterdam for a fortnight or, or something like that. And we've got his boss on the phone, I said, where is he, what's he doing? And we're like, we don't know where he is. Um, but anyway, he, he did these experiments and got them to work. Actually, the nice thing about it was, he, at the time he came, he, he'd got a paper that was in review, um, and they thought they knew what the binding site was for this protein, so they kind of used the old fashioned approaches, so they'd done a few footprints and that sort of stuff. And they thought, on the basis of a small number, I think it was two or three targets, that they could see what the motif was. And actually, when we got all of the chip data and we got all of the targets for this protein, uh, we could see that it was actually slightly different and it was actually binding to a palindrome. So they didn't think it was a palindrome, they thought it was something else. Um, but actually, it, it turned out it was. So I think his bots eventually forgave him. But, uh, but hopefully this will work. If it doesn't, I can show you his paper. So it actually turned out, that this turned out to be really interesting, not just for that reason. Okay, so there's the chip data. Uh, he actually checked all of them by doing these electrophoretic mobility shift assays. Okay, and that, that's the motif that it binds to. Okay, so you can see, see it's a palindrome, so TTG, ACCA. On the other strand here, TTG, ACCA. Okay, so the reason that they got confused uh, and kind of slightly tricked by this is because if you look at the, the sequence it kind of looks a bit like a direct repeat in parts as well. So this part here, TTG, is, is kind of similar to this bit here. Obviously this has got an extra G and then this bit here, AC, is a bit like that bit there, TC. So they thought it was an imperfect direct repeat because they were just looking at a very small number of targets. But when you look at them all together, you can see that it's this uh, perfect palindrome. Yeah. Oh yeah, you get lots of variation. So it's very rare. So the the perfect consensus is the ideal. You know, it's like the ideal binding site. But most binding sites vary from the consensus by a base or two. So if you look at all of the so these are all of the binding sites that we found in the paper, and this is the actual sequence. So the bases that are underlined are bases that are a perfect match to the consensus, and you can see you, you always get one or two that are missing from that. And in fact, we got this one that didn't have a site at all, um, so whether that was real or not, I don't know. Um, yeah, this is running too slow, I think, for us to look at today. But that's the motif that he got, anyway. Um, so the... What do you notice is weird about those peaks? There's something that is very weird and was completely unexpected when we did these experiments. I think right back to the start when I asked you about where transcription factors would bind with respect to genes. Yeah, you expect them to bind in places like this. Okay, but I think these three were the only ones that did. All of the other binding sites were right in the middle of a gene. Okay, so completely unexpected. Okay, so I, I mean, I don't think this was the first paper that showed it, but it was the first paper that showed it on such a wide scale. So I think 80% of the binding sites of this regulator are smack bound in the middle of genes. So completely the opposite to what you would expect. Okay, and the nice thing about doing chromatin amino precipitation was that it allowed us to see that. So if we'd have done things like footprints and gel shift assays, we'd have thought to ourselves, well, you know, they're not going to bind in the middle of the gene. We'd have never tested for that. 
okay, because we've got a biased way of thinking based on what's come in the past. But in this experiment, we could just look at the whole genome, where does it bind across the whole genome, and that allowed us to identify these weird binding sites. So we'd never actually worked out why it binds in the middle of genes. It's, it's still a mystery. Yeah. If it binds in the middle, does it mean it can, like, the transcription still starts, but it stops after through the gene, or is it just stopping the transcription? Yeah, so you might think that that would be the case, that it would act like a roadblock, but actually RNA polymerase, once it gets going, making the transcript, you know, it'd be like, it'd be like me standing in front of a train, you know, you know just bash me out of the way. So it, would, it doesn't work. So to make a roadblock with DNA binding proteins, you have to put, you know, lots and lots of copies of the DNA binding protein to have any effect. So if we all stood in front of the train, maybe it would slow down a bit, but otherwise it makes no difference. Um, but it's weird. So a lot of these genes that it binds in the middle of are genes that are either involved in the metabolism of nucleotides or they use nucleotides in some way. And RUTAR binds to DNA in response to the availability of nucleotides. So the function of the genes makes sense. And if you look in different bacterial species, they retain these binding sites, but it's just not obvious what their function is. So this is something that has, you know, it's now become a common theme. This paper is nearly 10 years old, but it's been, you know, every time people have now started to look at binding sites for transcription factors across chromosomes, they've seen this sort of thing, that actually it's not like we thought it was at all. They're not just restricted to sites at the start of genes, they're combined you know, wherever they want. This is an extreme example, but... Was it still not known why that was, why it effect stops the transcription of the entire thing and then by getting rid of it, if you don't know that way? In some cases, so, I mean, so, I mean, so what other options? So it could be like you said, that it's acts a roadblock, but for the reasons I explained, that seems unlikely. It could be that actually this is just a quirk of evolution. So when you think about how evolution works, you've got your genome, you get random mutations, you could have binding sites for things in the middle of genes. If that binding site doesn't cause a problem for the cell, there's no pressure for evolution to get rid of that binding site. Okay, there's no selective advantage to get rid of it, so it would just stay there. So that could be an option that's just, you know, just a quirk of evolution. It could be that actually, you know, we used to think that promoters just occurred upstream of genes, but we know now know actually there are lots of promoters within genes that make antisense RNAs, regulatory RNAs, that sort of stuff. They need to be regulated too, so it could be doing some things like that. So there are, you know, there are lots of options. But everyone thought they knew, you know, bacteria are just simple. They have promoters upstream of genes, and that's where the regulator binds. Simple. They did it in the 60s. You know, why bother? But actually, it's turned out to be way more complicated than that. And when we started getting these sorts of data, there was a lot of resistance from the scientific community. So like, oh, that can't be right. You know, it's not possible. And that's how it works. We all know that's how it works. But I think, you know, 10 years on, we started to change people's ideas and people are starting to accept it. But we still don't know what they're for. OK, so I think I'm pretty much done. So. This paper should be on Canvas with the data in the Excel file and also the extracted sequences if you want to have a look at it. Yeah, this... If you try this in the morning, it does it in seconds. If you do play with the sequences in mean, what you'll notice is that if you play around with the parameters a little bit, it'll give you slightly different answers. And that's just interesting to see, you know, how you need to be careful when you interpret the data. Okay, so I think we're done. If anyone wants to come and look at the lab and see how we do the experiments, I mean, it's not particularly mind-blowing, but I can show you if you want to hang around at the end.